Yeah, what up, y'all? It's your boy Flame, a.k.a. St. Lou. And remember, God does not need our good works, but our neighbor does, you feel? I say before you go, don't drop that extra note. <laughs> What's up, y'all? Welcome back to Extra Notes Academy. This right here is another response video. Now, in this video, I'm going to be responding to two brothers in the Lord. I want to say that this is not coming from a malicious place. I'm not being overly critical. These are brothers in the Lord that I value and I cherish. One, um, his name is Ligon Duncan. Two, his name is Thabiti Anyabwile. So I believe they both are Calvinistic in their thinking. Um, Ligon Duncan is more from the Presbyterian side of things. And I know there's even nuances in that space, in that realm as well. And Thabiti Anyabwile, I believe, is from the Baptist side of things. And I know, again, there's a spectrum and nuance even in that category as well. So I want to say that. But what I want to do is engage this topic that they are talking about, which is infant baptism. I want to engage it as a Lutheran because oftentimes the Lutheran voice is not present, especially among those who value the Reformation I think that's very odd and strange that Luther himself gave us the Reformation, but oftentimes in the spaces where the Reformation is discussed and valued, the Lutheran voice isn't present. And I think that's awkward and I think it's perhaps intentional, but we need to be at the table. You feel me? Because we have a lot to contribute in terms of the origin and the development and the most healthy way forward, and then to really represent Luther in the most integral way, I would argue. So anyway, um, again, this is going to be fun, so let's get into it. You know, the issue of baptism and infant baptism in particular can be a tricky thing for conservative Bible-believing Baptists and Presbyterians to talk about for a whole variety of reasons. Mm. For, for one, for Baptists who believe that baptism means the baptism of a professing believer. There's not an acceptance that infant baptism that has been done by you know scores of Christians around the world and in over the course of history that that's not baptism. Hmm. And consequently, when it comes time to join those churches, very often people that have been baptized as infants are asked required to hmm. be baptized as uh, adult professing believers and that that can make uh, that can make Baptists look narrow on this issue whereas those of us are pedo Baptists can look more accepting or broad but I like to tell folks that are coming to first Pres in real t real quick I just wanted to say that um, there are some similarities with the Presbyterian Calvinist or reformed thinkers with the Lutherans so both camps would value um, infant baptism, but there are nuances and differences in what we believe is taking place in the infant baptism. So we'll talk a lot more about that, but I just want to highlight that, that it's not equal. It's not the same. So yes, Presbyterian Calvinists do have infant baptism, but in many regards, there's a, there's, there's a difference that needs to be highlighted and discussed but we'll get into that. Let's keep it going. The inquirer's class process that I respect the principial position of Baptist churches on that point because they're wanting to be biblical in their view of baptism. They have an understanding of baptism mm. that requires it to be uh, for adult professing believers only. And they understand that to come to the Lord's table, you need to be baptized. So mm. if you haven't received baptism, you shouldn't come to the Lord's table. You shouldn't be a part of the membership of the church. What, you, you want to explain for anybody out there who's listening to us who doesn't understand why Baptists think that, why infant baptism is unbiblical, you want to explain that to them? Well, I, first of all, I want to thank you. <laughs> I did want to say also, I was a member at a Reformed Baptist church. Obviously, I won't say the name or the city or state. But I do remember an instance where there was a gentleman who wanted to receive communion. However, he was coming from a Presbyterian Calvinist church. And I believe also there they some camps may not practice full immersion where they may not fully dip you in the water and bring you up out the water. And for that reason, they withheld communion from him. And now thinking about that, reflecting back as a Lutheran, I'm thinking, man, that's rather odd that here it is in a Reformed Baptist space. 
Baptism is just an outward sign of an inward expression. It's just a metaphor or simile that reflects visually what Jesus did for us and what took place, you know, in our dying and rising with Christ. So it's, it's metaphorical. It's just a picture. It's, there's nothing real happening in terms of something salvific. Baptism is not a true means of grace in the sense that through the water itself connected with God's word, you are being regenerated or buried, killed in your sin and brought back to life or brought to life in Christ Jesus. So baptism is not that in a reformed Baptist space, but it's interesting thinking back that at that church, they withheld communion from him when for them it's just a symbol. So I think that's a bit odd that, you know, that they value it in some regard, but it's it's not literal in what's taking place in terms of salvation happening in the baptism, but yet they withhold communion. So anyway, just an interesting observation. Let's keep going. Uh, the BD's about to break it down from a Baptist standpoint. Let's go. Explain that to him. Well, I, first of all, I want to thank you for the way you handle that in inquirers class because it, it is, as a pastor, I, I, I feel a, a, a sensitivity around that. We have yeah. many wonderful folks who are coming from Pado Baptist backgrounds. They want to join the church. They love everything about the church. They love the people of the church. And then this becomes a, a hitch right. for them, a stumbling block. And you do get the sense that, you know, people are looking at you like, you've got all this water over here. You won't sprinkle a couple babies, you know. And so, you know, it's like it's not about being stingy. Yeah, we we yeah. think this is a command of the Lord. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, yeah, but just from a Baptist perspective, broadly, um, we, we would see, I think, a, a kind of logical sequence of things, the preaching of the gospel, uh, the working of God by his spirit in preaching the gospel in, in regeneration and conversion, um, and, and that reality being professed mm. uh, in baptism. Mm. Um, which is sort of the doorway into the church and the, and the privileges of the church, um, right. communion and, and so on, um, which means then that, that we have this, this awkward kind of responsibility for trying to discern uh, a credible profession of faith and um, sort of tacitly in, endorsing that profession in that entire process. Of ah, man, there's so much I want to say. Um, so I definitely want to talk about his statement of sort of discerning um, a person's, I guess, fruit or to see if their lives is is displaying something that looks like salvation. But it's so interesting coming from the Lutheran standpoint and really the ancient church um, and the majority of Christians in the world, we see baptism as arguably biblically that it is a means of grace. It is a, 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 a means whereby which God gives you life, right? So to, to examine fruit, to be sort of sitting back, listening in a person's story. Like, so for me, this is what happened in my Reformed Baptist space. When I joined a new church, they wanted to hear my testimony. They wanted to hear the story of my conversion. And when I went from one lifestyle to living for Christ, and they're listening intently to see if, if I understand my faith, if I am demonstrating fruit before they baptized me, and in Thabiti's words, allowed me to come through the doorways of the church to receive the benefits of the church. And again, that puts the onus on a person to display some measure of piety, to prove themselves worthy for baptism. And that, to me, just is the opposite of the gift of salvation, the gift of grace. Now, I can appreciate, like he said, you're trying to care for people, amen, but in terms of what baptism is, that's just awkward. And it's the it's 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 flipping the concept upside down. So taking as opposed so baptism as opposed to being a gift now becomes um something you earn. And I just think that's unfortunate. And another thing that he mentioned was um just the order of things. And I've talked about this in many places. So you see repent and be baptized in the scriptures. But what we should notice is they are neighbors. Repent and be baptized. That They're partners. The word and just means along with or also. So they go together. It's not about the order. Because if it's about the order, then the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, go as you're going and doing life. Baptize them, right? Make disciples by baptizing them. It says baptize first. So you can't hold on tightly to the order if it's different in Matthew 28, 
because it says baptize them, then teach them. So if it's about the order, do we just go out and randomly baptize uh, people that are not willing to be baptized? No, there's no biblical precedent for that. There's no example in the Bible of that. So we don't do that. However, the point is that both baptism and repentance are partners. They're neighbors. They belong together. Salvation is repentance and baptism together. So I think oftentimes we just put too much emphasis on the order. Incorrectly, we put the emphasis on the order. But anyway, I'm talking a lot. Let's keep going. Baptizing someone, bringing them into membership, um, enjoying the Lord's table mm-hmm. with them. Uh, we, we would see, uh, and maybe you can help, help me think through this more, but uh, where I think Presbyterians would see um, an analogy between circumcision in the Old Testament and baptism in the New, right. we would see discontinuities yeah. there. We would say one of the ways in which the, the New Covenant is different from the Old Covenant. Right. It's, it's not ethnic, it's, you know, right. um, it's, it's, it's the New Covenant, you know, the circumcision of the heart, right. and so on and so forth. Um, and so baptism properly belongs then to those who um, have had that experience of conversion. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in short, a Presbyterian would argue for infant baptism by saying that in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, in the Abrahamic Covenant and the New Covenant manifestation of God's mm-hmm. covenant of grace, God has made promises to believers and their children. Genesis mm-hmm. 17, the promises to you and your seed after you. Mm-hmm. Acts 2, the promises mm-hmm. to you and your children. Mm-hmm. And in both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, he's given specific signs of that promise that he's making. In the Old Covenant, circumcision, Genesis 17. In the New Covenant, baptism, Matthew 28 and Acts mm-hmm. chapter 2. And that since God in both Old Covenant and New Covenant has made promises to believers and their children and has given signs of those promises, those signs should be applied to believers and their children. It's actually a pretty simple argument. I think sometimes, I, mean, I, very, I was telling you before we started talking today that I, when I was growing up, I grew up in a county with 385 Baptist churches, Greenville County, South Carolina, and there were like 14 Presbyterian churches. So all of my Baptist friends thought that the reason that Presbyterians baptized babies was either we hadn't thought about it, um, we were liberals, uh, we were, it was a hangover from Roman Catholicism, it was just a tradition thing. They had no idea that we actually had tried to think about this from a biblical uh, standpoint. So I, I think on this issue, not unlike church government, Baptists and Presbyterians both believe that the Bible right. and the Bible alone should be our rule of faith and practice on how we practice here. We just come to different conclusions. Right. And you're, you're right to put your finger on continuity, discontinuity. I would, I would quickly say Presbyterians believe there's discontinuity sure. as well, even in the sacraments. Mm-hmm. On baptism and the Lord's Supper, there, there are significant discontinuities. Mm-hmm. Baptists view those dis- discontinuities in a different way, but we do both agree on continuity, discontinuity. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wonder if I can yeah, ask you a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Are, are there, uh, and, and I appreciate that, you, you yeah. know, um, are, are there any difficulties created um, for Presbyterian, when sort of pastorally, practically, by infant bap- infant baptism, by that yeah, practice. So, a, so, so yeah. for uh, man, that's so that's so interesting that the BD followed up with that question because as I'm sitting here listening to it, one of the things that strikes me is in the Baptist space, the primary concern seems to be behavior, um, just this desire to monitor, to um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm believing the best, right? Paul says, uh, love believes all things. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the best, but there seems to be this priority of like the practical, how this impacts, um, you know, people's morality, how this impacts the practical functionality of the, the community of believers. So it seems like that's a priority and the Baptist thought, believes that withholding baptism until you're of an age where you can cognitively think through your faith, it seems like they prefer that because it'll, it'll make things easier or less messy. You know what I mean? So it seems to be a priority there that's more practical in terms of everyday life and the, and the, the smooth functionality of the local church. And there isn't as much grappling with the continuity in scripture, the, 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 the church history, I guess, primary consensus on this matter. There seems to be other priorities there. But I did want to say um, in terms of baptism and um, 
circumcision. Circumcision. Paul does address it, though. So Colossians 2, 11, let's read it. It says, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses. So you do see this, this continuity and this connection between um, what Jesus is doing in the Christian by faith brought through baptism. That seems to be something that the Baptist um, I don't, I don't know again, the, the complete motivation behind it, but it seems to be something that isn't appreciated as much. At least when I hear Baptistic scholars and reformed Baptist theologians talk about it. Um, yeah, it seems like what seeps in again is that practical motivation to monitor morality and behavior and to really, um, keep baptism as, um, a, a reward as something that you earn after you prove that you have come to a place of piety, that you have come to a place of at least a level of moral performance that seems like you take G- Jesus seriously. And again, I'm not trying to be, you know, mean about it. It just seems like there's another priority there. But again, from this Colossians passage, Paul makes it very clear that he says that in him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. So this is not the same type of circumcision where they actually cut the flesh, but this is a different type of circumcision. He says, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So there's this circumcision of Christ whereby Jesus brings you into salvation, into his family. How, Paul? having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. So again, baptism is, is wedged in there as the, as the gift from God by faith that brings you into salvation into the family of God. And I just think that should be appreciated more and celebrate it so that we can rightly see baptism as a gift as opposed to a reward that you earn or an award that you achieve by showing or, or, or articulating your faith well enough where the person in front of you, the pastor, the theologian, the scholar, as he's listening and discerning within himself, he approves of you, and now you're worthy to be baptized and brought into the church. I just think that's the upside down of it all. And it's, and it's making baptism a work as opposed to it being a gift. Let's keep going. So, 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 so yeah. for, um, does it raise any questions or pose any challenges about the, the nature of the church, the constitution of the church and about things like no. shepherding, discipline, no. communion, no. those kinds of things? Yeah, I, I would say yes. And here, let me, let me laud the Baptist position for a second. One of the things that is beautiful about the Baptist position on baptism is that the church world distinction is crystal clear mm-hmm. in the church. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the church is composed of professing baptized believers. Mm-hmm. Um, the world are, is is outside of that, mm. and that unites both at the place of profession of faith mm. and at the administration of baptism. Mm. Whereas in Presbyterianism, that's separated right. by a degree of years. We believe in conversion, just like Baptists do. Yeah. We long for a public profession of faith, and we do not presume in the baptism of children that that is going to happen. We don't presume that children are elect, but we long for that and pray mm. for that. And so it does. See, that's another thing that's interesting to me is well, I talked about that difference between the Lutherans and the Pado baptists that are Presbyterian, Calvinistic, um, you know, and again, there's a range and different nuances in that space. Anglicans have some different things going on. So I respect those, those nuances and differences. But just engaging here, what Ligon is saying, there's this idea that 
baptism for the infant in their world just brings you into the covenant or the family of God. It's sort of the external outward covenant. So you're in a safer place, but you're not per se in Christ. So they're still waiting for, like you said, some, some conversion, some public display. And um, so it's a nuance, but, I think it, again, falls short of what the Bible says happens in baptism. So you do see these instances in the book of Acts with household baptisms. I think of Lydia. Um, I think of Cornelius, right? Uh, I think of the Philippian jailer. This oh, Now I'm going into Corinthians. <laughs> um, but, but you have these instances where in, in keeping with the Old Testament, when, when households are mentioned, it's including father, mother, um, children, servants. You think, I think about what God told Noah and his household that he was going to, he meant Noah and his family. I think about um, Abraham and when God instituted circumcision, he said, this is for you and your household. And even people that come from the outside world into your household, they need, the, the males need to get circumcised also. So, so circumcision in the old covenant actually did something and brought you in. And I believe biblically that baptism um, in a way that it is the fuller expression of circumcision, it actually does something. It doesn't sort of keep you at in, in just a safer space. It's actually salvific. That's the way the Bible talks about it is that um, uh, Acts 2 says repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is for you, your children, and all those who are far off. So something real is taking place. It's not just bringing you into a safer place. It's like, okay, now it's like if you were injured, right? And then you go to the emergency room. Yeah, you're in the hospital. You're not at the scene of the crime, but at least you're in the emergency room like, this safer place where you know the doctor is there and they're going to see you eventually, but you're not, you're not being healed. You know what I'm saying? And the Bible doesn't talk about baptism as some holding space, some safer space. It talks about it in a way where it's really saving you. It's really, Peter says, first Peter three, 21, he says that baptism now saves you. I mean, there's just no way around that. I mean, you can finesse it in terms of being consistent with your school of thought, but the plain meaning of the text, I mean, he goes on to say the same way Noah was saved through the water and his family, baptism now saves you. He says, not as a removal of dirt from the body. It's not just this outward thing that's doing something to you metaphorically or just on an external level. It's actually an appeal to God for a clean conscience. So it, it, it's salvific. It brings you into this reality where you and God are now good. You have a clean conscience before the Lord. That's a gift from him to us. It doesn't keep us in some holding place. And especially it's not just representative of something Jesus did long ago. But anyway, um, I'm going to let these gentlemen continue to get it in. <laughs> There, there, there isn't that clear line of demarcation as there is in the glories of Baptist ecclesiology <laughs> at that point. And so I do think that means that there are certain pastoral issues that we have to be particularly aware of. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. And, 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 and let's, let's put a lance in any kind of Baptist pride about that because as, as, as we see the age of baptism getting lower and lower yeah. and lower, we're becoming functional yeah, Presbyterians. Yeah, uh, Mark, you know? Mark, our friend Mark never talks about that all the time. Yeah. You know, the dangers of infant dedication, the slippery slope <laughs> infant baptism. <laughs> well, we won't solve this today, but maybe people will understand more what Baptists Amen. and Presbyterians think about infant Amen. baptism. Love you, brother. Yeah, you too. <laughs> <laughs> now, nah, that's dope. I love the cordial exchange. I think that needs to happen more, but not only just between the, the Reformed Baptists and the Reformed Presbyterians. We need to open that up so we can hear other voices of Christians who care deeply about these realities um, that we have the same Holy Spirit, and we have many things to contribute, um, much scholarship and, um, and, and erudite 
thinking regarding baptism. And I think to just keep it confound to Presbyterian Baptist and Reformed Baptist, you really are doing yourself a disservice. And that's one of the things I appreciate about um, the Lutheran voice is that we can we can be in a room and bring some clarity as to Luther's understanding regarding being saved by faith alone and how that's consistent with baptismal regeneration because oftentimes people forget that they they champion luther for for saying sola fide saved by faith alone scripture alone god's glory alone they champion luther for those things but then they remove from history that he also rightly taught that baptism is a gift from god so so to not have that accurate explanation in the room as you are you know, calling yourself a reformed thinker, I just think it it doesn't allow for the truth to be in a room in a sense of a more accurate representation of the the topic. You know what I'm saying? If we're talking about a topic, we want all the aspects on the table so we can rightly grapple with everything. So we can have a um a more broad awareness as to what's being discussed. Then we can get to the meat of it all, but when you completely remove Luther's contribution that you value and that's present in the room. But when you remove a large portion of it, you miss the totality on the topic. And I think that's unfortunate. Anyway, much more could be said. I've talked a lot. I went way longer than I intended. We're going to keep it going, man. We're going to be doing more of these response videos. So stay tuned, stay locked. Make sure you like, comment, let people know you are a student at Extra Notes Academy. Y'all already know, this your boy Flame, a.k.a. St. Lou. And remember, God does not need our good works, but our neighbor does, you feel? I say before you go, get that extra note. <laughs>